In the early years of the last decade, Microsoft still lived inside a familiar story. The personal computer was the front door to modern work, and Windows was the lock. If you controlled that lock, you controlled who could enter, what they could carry, and how often they paid rent. For decades, this had been the company's habit and its reflex. The operating system sat in the center like a sun, and everything else, from office to developer tools, moved in its gravity. By 2010, that gravity was already weakening. The world's new computing time was being measured in phones, browsers, and rented data centers. Windows still mattered, but it no longer defined the whole map. The culture flip that followed was not a single product launch. It was a redefinition of what platform meant. The new center became a set of services that could live anywhere. Cloud infrastructure, identity, and developer tooling. Cloud, in Microsoft's case, meant Azure, a global system of data centers and software that lets companies rent computing the way they rent electricity, paying for what they use and scaling up without building their own power plant. Identity meant the sign in systems that decide who a person is, what they are allowed to touch, and how trust moves across devices and networks, what Microsoft once called Azure Active Directory, and now calls Microsoft Entra ID. Developer tools meant the instruments that persuade programmers to build and deploy software through Microsoft's pipes, Net, Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and GitHub. Together, these pieces made a platform that did not need Windows to be in the room to make money. This was not an abstract philosophy. It came with named people, internal rivalries, and a timeline that feels, in hindsight, like a slow escape from a burning house. Windows Azure had been presented years earlier at Microsoft's Professional Developers Conference, with executives including Ray Ozzie and Bob Muglia, introducing the idea that Microsoft could run a platform online rather than only sell boxes and licenses. But the company's public posture in the Balmer era still leaned toward Windows as the main event. Microsoft chased a phone ecosystem, bought Nokia's devices business for about $7.2 billion, and tried to will Windows Phone into relevance. The story ended with an impairment charge of about $7.6 billion and a restructuring of the phone hardware business, a public admission that the old strategy could not simply be stretched into the new decade. Then came the leadership change that made the shift visible. Satya Nadella became chief executive in the first half of the decade and spoke plainly about a Microsoft that would win through cloud and mobility rather than by forcing the world to orbit Windows. That sentence was a signal flare to employees and customers who had learned to treat Microsoft as territorial. The message was also a kind of threat to Microsoft's own habits. If the company could no longer assume Windows would be the default, it had to make itself useful on other people's platforms, including those built by rivals. One of the earliest proofs was almost theatrical in its simplicity. Office arriving on the iPad. Take a look at the new iPad Pro and Apple Pencil and see what's possible with this incredible new technology. To have a developer come and show us what's possible with professional productivity. And who to know better about productivity than Microsoft? Yeah, these guys know productivity. So, I am... In late March of that year, Microsoft announced Word, Excel, and PowerPoint for Apple's tablet. It was not Windows first. It was revenue first, users first, and the admission that productivity could not be fenced into a single operating system anymore. If you want a real-world analogy, think of a bank that once insisted customers must visit one branch on one street and then quietly decides it would rather be paid through any door people choose to walk through. The deeper technical shift was aimed at developers, the group Microsoft has always needed and feared. In late 2014, Microsoft announced it would take major parts of the .NET server stack open source and make it cross-platform, explicitly naming Windows, Mac, and Linux as first-class citizens. 
This was a cultural reversal for a company whose earlier decades were defined by proprietary advantage. It also solved a practical problem. The modern internet runs on Linux in overwhelming numbers, and cloud customers do not want religious arguments when they are buying compute. They want compatibility, predictable costs, and a clear exit door if trust breaks. The company kept going. It joined the Linux Foundation as a Platinum member, a gesture that would have sounded like parody in the era of Windows versus Linux sermons. It announced the Windows subsystem for Linux at Build 2016, letting developers run a GNU and Linux environment directly on Windows, like allowing a rival language to be spoken openly in your own house because you have decided the rent matters more than the purity. At roughly the same time, Microsoft built a new kind of developer magnet that did not require Windows devotion. Visual Studio Code, a cross-platform editor built on web technologies and released broadly in the middle of the decade. A platform everywhere needs a marketplace, and Microsoft decided to buy the one developers already lived in. In early June of 2018, it announced an agreement to acquire GitHub for about $7.5 billion. GitHub was not just a code hosting site, it was the social layer of software, the place where reputations are formed, where projects recruit contributors, and where the modern habit of open collaboration is archived. Owning it gave Microsoft influence over the daily workflow of programmers who might never touch Windows. It also gave Microsoft an unusually intimate view of where software is going next, which languages are rising, which frameworks are decaying, and which security practices are being ignored. The next purchase was aimed at identity and business relationships rather than code. Microsoft bought LinkedIn for about $26.2 billion, folding a global professional network into a company that already sold email, calendars, documents, and corporate chat. On paper, it was a social network deal. In practice, it was an identity deal. It was a way to map work itself, to attach skills and hiring pipelines to Microsoft's productivity stack, and to profit from the fact that careers, like passwords, are now managed online. Azure, meanwhile, grew from a product into a financial engine. It became the back-end for startups and governments, banks and retailers, and it made Microsoft a primary rival to Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud. By the middle of the decade that followed, Microsoft disclosed that Azure had crossed an annual revenue mark of more than $75 billion, a number that would have been unthinkable when Windows licensing was treated as the crown jewel. The money did not come from selling Windows boxes. It came from rented compute, storage, databases, security tools, and the quiet tolls charged on identity and management. Identity is the least glamorous part of modern computing, which is why it is so powerful. If cloud is the power grid, identity is the key ring. Companies do not only want servers, they want to know who is allowed to sign in, from where, under what conditions, and with what proof. Microsoft renamed Azure Active Directory to Microsoft Entra ID to emphasize that it was no longer just a Windows-adjacent directory service, but a multi-cloud and multi-platform identity layer. This matters because identity sits upstream of everything. If you control the sign-in, you shape which tools are trusted, which data can move, and how securely a business can operate. It is also sticky. Once a large organization wires its permissions, compliance, and security policies through one identity system, leaving becomes expensive and frightening. Developer Tools completed the triangle, Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio remained dominant developer environments in industry surveys, a reminder that Microsoft's old strength with developers did not die. It relocated. In the Stack Overflow Developer Survey, Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio continued to rank at the top among environments used by developers, showing how thoroughly Microsoft's tooling had escaped the boundaries of Windows-only development. With GitHub, those tools became connected to a broader pipeline. Store the code, review it, test it, deploy it to Azure, secure it with Microsoft Identity, 
and monitor it with Microsoft's cloud management services. A platform everywhere is not a slogan if it can charge at each step. The story also has friction, because power always does. The legal controversies arrived first, as they usually do when a platform grows strong enough to look inevitable. In Europe, Microsoft faced scrutiny for bundling Teams with Microsoft 365 and Office 365, a tying practice that rivals argued distorted competition. Microsoft began unbundling Teams in Europe and later moved towards separating Teams and Office globally under antitrust pressure. The European Commission continued to pursue the matter and later accepted commitments from Microsoft aimed at addressing competition concerns. This was a familiar pattern. Microsoft making concessions at the edge so the core engine can keep running. Financial controversy came with the cost of reinvention. The Nokia episode was not just a failed bet. It was a lesson in how expensive it can be to cling to a fading center. The write-down and restructuring signaled to investors that Microsoft would no longer burn cash trying to recreate the phone ecosystem that Apple and Google already owned. Instead, Microsoft would profit from being the layer underneath, selling tools and cloud services to businesses regardless of which phone or laptop their employees carried. Political controversy arrived through government contracts and the unavoidable fact that cloud is now strategic infrastructure. The United States Department of Defense canceled the Jedi cloud contract after years of dispute and moved toward a multi-vendor approach. Later, the Pentagon awarded a large joint warfighting cloud capability contract structure across multiple providers, including Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and Oracle. These deals are not only about money, they are about national systems choosing which corporate platforms will host sensitive operations. That choice invites scrutiny, lobbying, and internal debate. Microsoft has also faced public employee protests about its work and contracts related to military uses of artificial intelligence, a sign that the platform everywhere strategy has moral and political consequences inside the company itself. Technical controversy followed, sharper and more modern, when Microsoft and GitHub pushed into generative AI for programming through GitHub Copilot, the question was not only whether it worked, but whether it was lawful and fair to train on public code. A class action complaint was filed in federal court by open source programmers against GitHub, Microsoft, and OpenAI, arguing violations tied to open source licensing and attribution. This is the new kind of platform dispute not about file formats or browser defaults, but about how machine learning systems absorb the labor of millions and then sell it back as a service. Microsoft's partnership with OpenAI made the stakes even higher. Microsoft announced a computing partnership years earlier and later stated that Azure would serve as OpenAI's exclusive cloud provider for its workloads across research, products, and application programming interface services. This was the platform everywhere strategy at full intensity. Not only hosting the world's AI boom, but weaving it into Microsoft's own products, from developer tools to business software. It also revealed a cold truth about the new Microsoft. The company no longer needed Windows to be loved. It needed Azure to be necessary. The comparison to rivals is instructive. Apple remained vertically integrated making hardware and software a closed, polished corridor. Google remained tied to the economics of advertising and the browser, building platforms that are wide and often free, because attention is the commodity. Amazon turned retail logistics into a cloud empire and still treats infrastructure as a profit center. Microsoft's path became distinct. It built an enterprise platform where identity and compliance are as central as compute, and where developer workflows are captured end-to-end. -end. The weakness of this approach is also its strength. It risks becoming too entangled in the daily operations of institutions, attracting antitrust attention and ethical scrutiny. But it also makes Microsoft difficult to replace, because replacing it can mean rewiring the keys, the power, and the workshop at the same time. Across time, 
the human impact is quieter than a gadget launch, but more permanent. A generation of workers now signs into Microsoft services from laptops that do not run Windows, collaborates through tools that are not tied to a single device, and builds software in editors that run on any operating system. Companies hire through LinkedIn, authenticate through Entra, deploy through Azure, and ship code through GitHub. The cultural change inside Microsoft, from guarding Windows to selling platforms everywhere, helped normalize a broader industry truth. The center of modern computing is not a single machine on a desk. It is the network of services that decide who you are, what you can do, and where your work is allowed to live. That is why this story matters. Microsoft learned to make money when Windows is not the center by shifting the definition of center itself. Cloud became the rented foundation. Identity became the gate. Developer tools became the habit. The flip was not sentimental. It was survival, executed with patience, acquisitions, and a willingness to let old pride dissolve. In the end, Microsoft did not abandon Windows so much as it stopped treating Windows as the only crown worth protecting. It built a new crown out of infrastructure, trust, and the daily routines of the people who write the world's software.